An explanation of options for children with epilepsy when medications fail, as discussed by neurologist Peter Morrison. Hello, my name is Peter Morrison. I'm a neurologist at Maine Medical Center uh, with a particular interest in pediatric epilepsy. And today I'm talking um, on what to do when medications uh, fail to adequately control seizures. One is to give you an overall idea of the scope of the problem of medically refractory seizures and then talk about some of the options. Uh, these include epilepsy surgery, various therapeutic diets, and techniques of neurostimulation, uh, which are a bit newer. A third of patients will not have seizures that can be controlled adequately by medications. About half of these will be epilepsy surgery candidates. Uh, and in appropriately selected candidates, this is probably the best option. Sur uh, seizure surgery should be considered after failing anticonvulsants. Uh, and this may be uh, considered as soon as failing two or three anticonvulsants. One doesn't necessarily have to try every anticonvulsant out there before going to seizure surgery, as sometimes it's really the best option. Typically, uh, seizure surgery evaluation involves inpatient monitoring, uh, recording a patient's seizures to try to determine where they come from, and there are very te various techniques for imaging uh, brain lesions that could be causing seizures, including MRI scans, SPECT scans, PET scans, etc. And there are various surgical uh, options available depending on the extent of the lesion. Early surgery can certainly be life-altering and can make a, a huge difference uh, in a patient's life. Uh, this slide just gives one example. Uh, you can see on the brain here, half of the brain is malformed and this is a condition known as hemimegencephaly. The surgical treatment here is a hemispherectomy where half uh, of the brain is removed. Surprisingly, kids can do very well, uh, often uh, walking with a limp, maybe having decreased use of a hand, uh, but certainly they can have uh, a cognitive blossoming after surgery if surgery can adequately control seizures. This is just another example uh, of a brain malformation known as cerebral heterotopia, again amenable to surgery. So epilepsy surgery outcomes, uh, it may vary depending on the type of surgery. In general though, as you can see from this slide, uh, anywhere from 60 to 90 percent of patients can be uh, seizure-free or markedly improved from epilepsy surgery. And so this is a reason for thinking about performing epilepsy surgery early, if it's a possibility. Now, about a half of patients who don't have their seizures adequately controlled by medication are not surgical candidates for various reasons. And so other options have to be considered. Uh, one excellent option uh, include therapeutic diets. There are a variety of diets that have, have been tried, namely the ketogenic diet, something known as the low glycemic index diet, and more recently, the Atkins diet. Probably the best studied for seizure control is something called the ketogenic diet. So what is the ketogenic diet? Uh, the ketogenic diet is a high fat, adequate protein and carbohydrate diet, which induces ketosis uh, in patients that consume it, meaning that their bodies can use ketones rather than sugar as fuel for the brain. Interestingly, fasting as treatment goes back uh, to the time of Hippocrates. There are mentions of it in the Old Testament Obviously, fasting is not a long-term solution. Dr. Wilder, in 1921, invented the ketogenic diet to mimic the fasting state. So the basic prescription for the ketogenic diet involves a ratio of fat and carbohydrates to protein. In general, infants can be given a ketogenic diet formula, which is relatively easy to take. In children, usually it involves working closely with a dietitian to structure a diet that adequately creates ketosis. As you can see here from these small pie charts, the ketogenic diet is very high in fat when compared with the traditional American diet. And so it's not a minor change that you make in your diet, but a real lifestyle change. In patients in whom it works, however, most families find it absolutely worthwhile. In general, there have been a number of single center and multi-center studies as to the efficacy of the ketogenic diet. And in patients with medically refractory epilepsy who are not surgical candidates, the ketogenic diet probably offers the best chance of markedly improved seizure control. Now, it certainly doesn't work for everyone, but we typically know within the first one to three months whether it's going to be a successful treatment. And if it is, children can consume this diet for many years uh, and often, and we don't quite understand why, continue to do well after the diet is discontinued. Now, the diet is not without a side effects. Children can occasionally have constipation. Uh, there may be some slow weight gain, slowed growth, 
although usually this is not significant. Uh, there have been vitamin deficiencies in the past, and so this is now supplemented. Uh, we can also see renal stones. Typically, there are medications to help prevent these types of complications, and the diet is usually well tolerated. Now, for those children in whom the diet doesn't work uh, or who the diet is not tolerable, there are some other emerging technologies for seizure control. Uh, one that's been around for a while is the vagus nerve stimulator, and we'll also talk about some other neurostimulation devices. So the vagus nerve stimulator uh, is an implantable device. Uh, it was approved uh, by the FDA and has been in use since about 1997. The vagus nerve stimulator is typically implanted in the chest wall and stimulates the left vagus nerve. Uh, it's typically a day surgery and well tolerated. How the vagus nerve stimulator works is not entirely clear. We think it involves uh, stimulating regions of the thalamus, but again, the mechanism is not entirely understood. In terms of efficacy, the vagal nerve stimulator is not a magic bullet, although for some patients it works very well. In general, about 35% of patients uh, respond, that is, have a better than 50% uh, improvement in their seizure frequency. Uh, this is probably similar to adding another uh, medication, although in some patients uh, it's better tolerated. Other neurostimulation devices available for seizure control are now becoming available. One is called Neuropace, which is currently uh, under study. Neuropace is basically a pacemaker for the brain. It's a device that can record seizures and can be taught to recognize seizures. And when a seizure is recognized, a pulse can be delivered to interrupt that seizure. This is just an x-ray demonstrating the implantation of the device. In the initial Neuropace uh, trial, which was primarily looking at safety but also measured efficacy, uh, about 32% of patients with complex partial seizures and about 60% of patients with generalized seizures had an improvement with the Neuropace stimulator. And then finally, uh, something that's kind of new on the horizon is deep brain stimulation. Uh, a deep brain stimulator is implanted into the thalamus. A recent completed study uh, demonstrated that at two years, uh, an, about, there was about a 57% reduction from baseline seizure control. Um, now, both of the neurostimulation trials have enrolled primarily patients over 18, and so this isn't always an option for children. But we hope as we learn more about these devices, it'll open up this option for children as well. So just to summarize, about a third of patients with epilepsy will not have their seizures adequately controlled by medication. About half of those are surgical candidates, and it's important to identify who those patients are. For those who aren't surgical candidates, there are a variety of other options. These include therapeutic diets and various neurostimulators. And just finally, thanks to Eric Kossoff, who is a professor at Johns Hopkins Hospital, uh, who kindly lent me some slides on the ketogenic diet.